Well, welcome. My name is Scott Sliver, and I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, although over the past couple of years, if you didn't know, two years ago, I went to truck driving school, and I can't believe it's been two years ago. And I drove over the road for a year. I drove 100,000 miles. Um, and over the past year, if some of you know Tip City, uh, Abbott Technologies makes Insure and Pedialyte. I take empty trailers to the plant. They fill them up, take them over to the warehouse. I do that nights, you know, sort of like truck driver at night, pastor by day sort of thing, I guess. Uh, but I am on my five days off. I work the weirdest schedule. I work, I work five days, I have two days off. I work two days and I have five days off. And uh, the last time we had five days off, two weeks ago, Memorial Weekend, my wife and I went back to New York where we met and got married. And uh, our son played a show there. So we get to do a little bit of traveling. The joke is I'm semi-retired. So, but thanks, Caleb. Appreciate the opportunity uh, to be here today and to share. Uh, I think I'm doing the last installment of uh, go from rubble to revival. And basically what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna echo what, what Caleb talked about, Dylan, Matt Reed, you know, they've, they've really done the series, but I just wanna tell you my story uh, because I think my story is pretty common for how most of us find our, our purpose in this life in terms of, God, what is it you want me to do? Okay, I don't wanna get too far ahead, but that's, I just wanna let you know that's kind of where I'm headed and how I think it applies to your life with uh, using scripture along the way. How's that sound? Good, good. Um, well, if you have a Bible and you'd like to follow along, you can go to Nehemiah chapter one. This series uh, it has been out of the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. Although I'm only gonna quote one little verse out of that that is really meaningful to me. It's uh, Nehemiah 1.11. And Nehemiah, it just very short and simply says, I was a cupbearer to the king. And that is a verse that I relate to because I've always been a guy, I'll charge any hill somewhat reluctantly. You know, I consider myself a, a person of faith uh, and I, I am a risk taker, but I am a calculated risk taker. Any of you with me on that? You know, uh, I've never had any desire really to go overseas to do world missions. And then I get invited to go speak at a conference in Rwanda, which is this tiny little country, like the size of Rhode Island, in the middle of this massive continent in Central Africa. And I got invited to go and speak at an international conference. There were 23 countries represented there about how to reach your culture for Christ. Now, does that make any sense to you? You bring a middle-aged white guy to Africa to speak about how to reach your culture for Christ, right? But that's, I, I, I was sharing with the team, uh, we always have sort of a little huddle before service, make sure we're all on the same page, you know, make sure Scott has his mic when he walks out on stage, that sort of thing. And, and I, I, I was just sharing about, you know, this is, this is gonna be where I'm headed today. This is going to be the, where I'm gonna take people. And I just wanna share my story with you and hopefully you can relate to this. Can you bring up that chart? Dylan has this now famous chart um, that was uh, really well put together about Zerubbabel, Ezra, and Nehemiah and about their calling. I think all of our calling, and Matt Reed really did a good job of talking about this part, that our calling is to, to love God and to be faithful to him. That's sort of the, the big picture. But Zerubbabel was called to be a leader and a builder. Ezra was called to reconciling people back to God. And Nehemiah, who I just, I really relate to Nehemiah because I love our city. When I say our city, I'm talking about Dayton and of course the Dayton region, but I'm a Dayton-centric person, right? When people say, where are you from? You say Dayton, they always say, what part? Huber Heights. That is not Dayton, that is the Dayton area. I grew up in Eaton, and when I went to college, I told people I was from Dayton, because nobody had ever heard of Eaton. Any, Preble County? Any Preble County? No. Can anything good come from Preble County? Probably not. But he was called, he was the cupbearer to the king. So he was in, really in the presence of a, a powerful person. But I, what I love about the story is that the king looks at him and says, are you okay? Are you all right? 
you, you don't seem like yourself. And you'd think a king might not ever notice anything like that. He says, well, king, you know, how can I be, how can I be like happy when my city lays in ruins? And I love that the king says, well, what are you going to do? He says, oh, I want to go and I want to rebuild the wall. And the king says, well, what do you need? And he's already got an answer. And he says, I need these supplies and I need safe passage and I need the time off. And the king gave him everything that he asked for. And he was just, you know what I mean? Just a cup bearer. But he had this dream. And I think, I think he is a great picture for every one of us in this room or anyone watching on the internet that, that those, that's how God can use us. It's just being a normal, regular person, doing your job, you have a dream and you just trust that the Lord will take you there. In uh, John 3.16, which is the, it encapsulates all of the gospel in just one verse or two verses, that I was thinking about Jesus and his calling and his purpose and his mission, if I was going to sort of categorize it, and Caleb and I were texting back and forth, like, this is kind of how I see it, what do you think? And he weighed in on it, and we kind of went back and forth with this. And this is what we came up with, that Jesus calling, obviously, the Son of God, right? Son of God, the gift to the world, sent from God for everlasting life to redeem humanity. That's the big picture, right? John 3.16 says this, For God so loved the world, that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him sh shall not perish, but have eternal life. Now, that's the, that's the verse that gets all the press, but listen to verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Isn't that beautiful? God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Now, you might be familiar with a guy, his name's Tim Tebow. Are you familiar with him? He gets real mixed reactions, right? Uh, can you bring up this picture? Let's show people who Tim Tebow is. This is probably what he is most famous for. He was uh, a Heisman Trophy winner. Did you know he was the only, I think he's the only sophomore, he was certainly the first sophomore to win the Heisman as a sophomore in college at the University of Florida. He was a Gator led them to a national championship, all that. He got drafted, his first round draft pick, but his NFL career never really amounted to much. He was drafted by the Broncos, um, right, Denver Broncos. And he only played a couple of seasons, kind of bounced around, tried his hand at baseball, didn't work, you know, kind of in and out. But this is what made him infamous. And you know, here's the thing, what's really interesting is this wasn't the first verse that he had on the, on the blacks on his cheeks. Did you know, do you know what the first verse was? It was Philippians. Philippians 4.13, I, uh, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And he said he wanted a verse on there just because other players would put things on theirs. And he said, I wanted something that would encourage people. So at first it was Philippians 4.13. Then his coach, who was really superstitious, he felt like, Tim Tebow felt like he wanted to up the game and change the verse. You might say that the Lord put it on his heart to put John 3.16 on there. And he went to his coach, and the coach was like, you can't change that verse. Like, that's been our lucky verse all this time. But he said, no, I, I have to do this. So he did it. He didn't really think anything about it, just did it. And right after the game, their media person from, uh, from the University of Florida came to him and said, you know what happened? 94 million people searched John 3.16 during, during that game. Now, I mean, I'm a church kid. I grew up going to church. I've known John 3.16 is probably, it's one of the first verses, if not the very first verse that I ever learned. It's hard for me to imagine somebody not knowing John 3.16. Right? For those of us in this room, some of you, how many of you were not, you didn't grow up in church, and the first time you heard John 3.16, it was like as an adult, right? It happens. And it's amazing to me that 94 million people searched that verse just because he put it on his cheeks. It's pretty incredible. Let me give you a statistic. So like I say, it's, it's easy for us as believers to think 
you know, that everybody knows that, right? But only 20% of Americans today attend church regularly, or we might say weekly, okay? Only, that's one out of five people, okay? Nearly 60% seldom or never attend church. Now, for me, I go, really? I mean, I know that, I know that, you know, I know that's true, but I, I just can't hardly relate to it because it's, it's just a big part of my life. It's always been part of my life, even when I didn't want to go as a kid. You know, my parents kind of dragged me there. Uh, it, but not everybody knows this, and we have to remember that as believers. What we just take for granted, not everybody knows that. So Jesus calling, he's the son of God, gift to the world, sent from God for everlasting life to redeem humanity. What was his purpose? His purpose was to reveal the Father. That's why he came. He, to show us the Father. In John 17, it says, so Jesus uh, is praying, and he says, Righteous fa Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I've made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I might myself may be in them. I like how he just kind of plainly said in John 14, anyone has, who has seen me has seen the Father. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That's ultimately what got him crucified. You know that, right? Where he made himself one. He, I and the Father are one. Before Abraham was, I am. Boy, that just set the religious leaders on fire. So his purpose was to reveal the Father. Okay, so those are the big picture things. But then how... How did Jesus walk it out? This is where I live. I'm not the most, you know, big picture kind of person. I just want to know, how do I do this? <laughs> right? There are a lot of things in the Bible I can't do, but Jesus said, I was hungry and you fed me. I can do that. Right? What was his mission or what was his assignment? And you look at the I am's, the I am statements that Jesus made or the signs that he did, and it really reveals, it revealed to the people that were there what his mission or what his assignment was and how it backed up the, the purpose and the calling on his life. The seven I am statements, he said, I am the bread of life. I'm the light of the world. You know, if you believe in me, he who believes in me will not walk in darkness. I am the door that we, we enter the kingdom through him. He said, I am the good shepherd. We all know that one, right? I'm the good shepherd. He said, I know my sheep and my sheep hear my voice and they know my voice. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way and the truth and the life. I am the true vine. When I think of the I am statements, the one, the one that stands out to me is when he said, I am the way and the truth and the life. But then the tough part is, he said, no one comes to the Father except through me. That's what's difficult for the world around us to understand. But nobody made the claims that Jesus made. You know that? Nobody made those claims. Nobody else rose from the dead, <laughs> right? Nobody else did the things that Jesus did. I love in uh, Acts chapter 10, the apostle Peter was speaking with a man named Cornelius. And he just kind of, he's telling the story and he, and he says, well, Cornelius, you know how, how Jesus of Nazareth went around uh, with the Holy Spirit and power and how he just went around doing good. See, when you take all this big picture stuff and you bring it down to a statement like that, for me, I go, okay, now I have something to hang on to. Now I have something that I can relate to. You know, I'm, I may not be able to go out and, you know, raise the dead or do these big things. And maybe I can if the Lord needs me to or us to. He can do that, right? I, I honestly believe it. I believe if I needed to walk on water, that he could help me to walk on water. I also know people drown every day, <laughs> right? So, but if I die, I'll go be with the Lord and that's, that's okay, don't, don't have a conversation amongst yourselves. Scott said he could walk on water. He did not say that. He said he might drown. Oh, so he didn't have any faith. Oh, Lord. 
for me, we really could stop. We could stop right here. Because that's the essence of figuring out what it is, how we figure out what it is that God has called each of us to. In Matthew chapter 20, and this is another one of the verses that I would call it like a life verse, or this is a verse that keeps me on track, okay? Jesus said this, he said, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And then he said this, just as the son of man did not come to be served, but to what? But to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. I remind myself of this verse I could probably, probably say, honestly, on a daily basis. Now, obviously we're talking about extending God's kingdom and maybe drawing people into the kingdom, seeing people come into relationship with him. But you know what? It applies to me as a husband. You know, I'm pretty well known for uh, mowing vacant lots in my neighborhood. I can and have mown, mowed up to nine different vacant lots in my neighborhood and my yard looks terrible. You know why? Because I hate mowing my yard. I do. I hate it. I hate mowing my yard as much as I hate doing dishes. I love to cook. I'm a very good cook. Ask my wife. I love to cook. I hate doing dishes. We're a match made in heaven. I make a mess and she cleans it up. We're, we're, we're both good. I don't mind doing laundry. You should see our laundry. It's we have this rack, you know, a rolling rack that we hang things on. It's black, 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 magenta, black, 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 black. I almost took a picture to show you because it really is laughable. I have like 15 t-shirts and a collared one. I wore my nice collared one for you today. Isn't that nice? Yeah. Even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Remember, we're talking about calling, we're talking about purpose and mission or my assignment. What is it that I'm going to do or what I'm supposed to do? In Romans 8, great, great chapter in the Bible. Romans chapter 8. When I think about who we are, when I think about who I am, as a follower, what does that, what does that mean? I'm, I'm more than like a label of Christian or, I'm, uh, uh, or even pastor. Follow me on this verse here, Romans 8, starting in 15. It says, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and you could say daughtership, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. It's intimate. Because we've been adopted. We're his sons and daughters. Isn't that amazing? Let, I love to just sort of marinate in that. The idea that we're sons and daughters of the Most High. It's incredible. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we're children, then what? The logical thing is we're heirs. We're heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. And then here's the tough part. If... We indeed share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. You know what? Suffering is part of being a believer. We don't like to talk about that. I don't like talking about that. I initially didn't even have that on here. I thought, I'm not going to go there. Josh was like, you sure you don't want to put that? Because it is conditional. We're heirs, co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share, there's a part of being a believer that just suffering goes with. You know, my worst day of suffering is not like suffering around the world. Right? Let's be real. It's just not. Even the comments people have made about me being a pastor when I was running for office or whatever and all that kind of stuff, that's not suffering. We are sons and daughters. Again, the big picture. I'm going to go big picture. I'm going to pull out again. In Matthew chapter 22, Jesus replied when he was asked, what is the great command? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. You can take the whole, all that, all this to right, like right here. All that, the thick part. 
all of it you can, I mean, Jesus summarized it. Love God and love people. How do we love God? Well, we worship. We spend time in worship. Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. There's, there's an aspect of serving. My service becomes worship to the Lord. And I think we love God by loving our neighbors, by loving them into a relationship with him. I'm not gonna convince anybody by quoting 20 Bible verses, you know, that, that they need to become a believer. We need to show them God's character. We need to show them his goodness. We sing the song about the goodness, I'll sing of the goodness of God, and I believe that. But the neighbor, our neighbors, they don't know John 3, 16. They don't know that God is good. So we have to show that to them. We have to demonstrate that to them. In Matthew 13, there's a parable. And I think this really captures the essence of what I'm trying to get across to you today. Uh, there are, you know, depending on how you dice it and slice it, somewhere between 20 and 40 parables. Uh, and this is just two. And I think these are two that kind of get passed over because they're not like the parable of the prodigal son or the, the father, right, or the two sons where, you know, one goes off and comes back and the father accepts him and the older brother gets upset. It's not like that or the parable of the good Samaritan, you know, and it's in depth and it tells this deep thing. But catch this. The kingdom of heaven, if you want to know what the kingdom of heaven is like, Jesus is about to tell us. The kingdom of heaven is like, a, is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy, he went and sold all that he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. When I look at these two, bear with me in this, okay? I want a little bit of latitude here. You have one person who's out just doing their job. It doesn't say, it just says, it's, the kingdom is like a treasure that's hidden in a field and a man found it. It doesn't say he was looking at it like the second parable that the man was looking for, for a very specific pearl. I don't know if you collect things, but you can start searching all over the internet. You know, that's the new way we search for things. We don't have to go looking, right? But you, or some people you love to go uh, garage sailing and you find things and you go, wow. You hear, if you ever watched uh, Pawn Stars, right, where they go and they find something and they take it in and you find out this painting that they bought for $20 is worth tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars. Okay, so I think this guy's just out minding his own business, doing his job, he's plowing the field and he stumbles across this versus the person. I think there are people who know what it is that, that God has called them to, you know, but I think that's not most of us. And I don't think it's because we're not listening. I don't think it's because God hasn't spoken to us. I just think we're just humans. And we're trying to figure it out. And, you know, you talk to people, they go to college and they change their, their uh, major three times or whatever. It's like, you know you're spending a ton of money here. You need to narrow this down real quick, right? Go to Sinclair the first two years, get your prereqs in, and then do whatever, right? But I think this is really kind of how most of us find our way is we're just doing our job and then we discover. I want to I wanna show you something. Bring, if you could bring this up. Bring up the picture. That is me at my high school graduation doing the invocation. Isn't that weird? Like, whoa. Okay, this is... This is like June of 1981, when I graduated from high school. And look at this, look what I found. I actually have a printed copy, you know, that came from a negative, right? <laughs> Probably came from Kmart, you know, the pharmacy department where they had the photos dropped off. Uh, and I look at that and I go, well, isn't that crazy? And here I am today, 40 years later, standing behind a podium talking about Jesus. Now, let me just tell you, I ended up doing that because I was on student council, and they go, you go to church, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, guess what? You're doing the invocation. It's funny because my, my youngest son, Zach, who's now, you know, 33, I think, uh, Zach was in the Marine Corps, 
And every year the Marine Corps uh, has a, a Marine Corps ball to celebrate their anniversary, right? And they've been doing this for, you know, a century. And, and the guys in Zach's division or whatever um, said to him, your dad's a pastor, right? Yeah? Well, guess what? You get to do the invocation at the Marine Corps Ball in Japan. And I went, that's how it starts, son. And then I apologized, sorry, you know. I always felt bad for our kids when they were in school because, you know, I was a pastor and my wife was a clown. That's not an insult, that's the truth. And they go to school on the first day, what do your parents do? Oh, my dad's a pastor and my mom's a clown. And I always go, yeah, a pastor and a clown walk into a bar. It's funny. It'd be a pastor, a clown, and a rabbi, right? That's the horse walks into a bar, and the bartender says, hey, why the long face? That sort of thing. I was, uh, you know, so I, I did. I grew up in church. I believed in Jesus. I walked down the long center aisle at the Eaton Church of the Brethren to Just As I Am. Gave my life to Jesus when I was like 11 or 12 years old. Knew that I needed him. I didn't understand. I mean, how big of a sinner are you when, you know, when you're 12? I don't know. But I knew that I needed Jesus and I wanted his forgiveness, whatever that, that was. So yeah, I ended up doing, doing that. I went to art school. I really wanted to go. Here's a really interesting thing to me is I really wanted to go to my denomination uh, the, to the, the college. Um, it's Manchester University in Indiana, I really wanted to go there, but for some reason my dad didn't want me to. And I, secretly I wanted to go to art school. I wanted to go to the Art Institute of Pittsburgh. I thought there was no way my dad would ever back that. And you know what? He came home one day from, uh, from the high school with a catalog before you could go online and search, right? This is like a website that you can hold. <laughs> Have you ever did, I, I was looking at this picture the other day and I went like this to try and enlarge it. That, <laughs> doesn't work. Anyway, my dad comes home with a catalog from the Art Institute of Pittsburgh. And I remember uh, being a senior, uh, going on a, a retreat. We went to Pokagon Park in, I think that's in the corner, north eastern corner of Indiana, and we went tobogganing. And we're like sitting around the campfire singing Kumbaya at two in the morning. And I remember talking to Dave Moore, who was our youth, one of our youth guys. And, and I said, Dave, how's, ever, how's God ever going to use me in advertising? Because at that point, I went to vocational school for two years at the JVS, now called the CTC. And I knew what I wanted to do. Um, and, and he said, well, you know, maybe you'll work at a Christian magazine, or maybe you'll design albums for Christian bands, not really knowing or understanding that God needs Christians everywhere. <laughs> How about you just be a Christian and work at an advertising agency? Right? Shazam. Um, but that was, I mean, that was really my heart back then, was how's God ever going to use me in advertising? Well, I worked for two years. I visited my college friend. I was kind of doing my own thing, not really pursuing the Lord. I uh, went to visit a friend in New York, uh, my friend Tom. We'd gone to high school together, went to college together. He went to New York. I came back to Dayton. And I said, hey, uh, I want to come visit. And so I visited him, and over the next several months, I had uh, talked to other people about maybe moving to New York, and I just thought it's never going to happen. And I prayed with a guy who was an art director who was a really strong believer, like actually played Christian music in his office, Right? And everybody would walk by and go, who's that? You know, because they didn't know anybody. And, you know, still don't really. And um, except for I can only imagine everybody knows that. So, but he prayed with me. And I said, after we prayed, I said, I think I'm supposed to move to New York. And he looked at me and said, I think you are too. Uh, so I talked to my friend. He said, yeah, you can move in with me. Uh, I bought a one-way ticket. Moved to New York on a Saturday of Labor Day weekend. Went to church with him on Sunday. And I met my wife the next day. Isn't that crazy? And how long have we been married? 38 long years, right. <laughs> some, some, yeah. She deserves that, trust me. 
if you only knew. When we were when we were getting married, we got married pretty quickly. Uh, like in, I, I moved in September. We got married the following May, and the pastor at our at our during our wedding ceremony, he turned to Bonnie and he said, "I think you need to be prepared because Scott's being called into ministry." Here I am. I'm working at the the number one agency in the country. Uh, I was doing a full page Merrill Lynch ad every day, just living my dream, what I wanted to do when I was 15. Here I was 22. And he says this, never thinking it was ever going to happen. Well, anyway, um, end up moving back to Dayton, ultimately ending up in Cincinnati where we started attending the Vineyard Church. There, were, there was a couple that we were friends with in New York that it, she was from Cincinnati. And they were going to the Vineyard in Cincinnati and we would go and spend the night at their house, you know, have pizza and then the next day go to church with them. And man, we love this church. I got offered a job in Cincinnati and guess where we went to church? Cincinnati Vineyard. I filled out a Connect card. You know, we badger you about Connect cards every week. I filled out a Connect card on my first day, and Marcy Rowe, Caleb's mom, called me that afternoon and said, Hey, I saw that you filled out a, a, a Connect card and that you want to work in the junior high department. Like, who wants to do that? <laughs> you know? And, uh, and I said, Yeah. And she goes, Well, we're having a meeting tonight. And I drove all the way, you've ever driven the belt loop around Cincinnati? All the way, all the way around, like you're going to Riverfront, you know, all the long way around. And, and I went to this meeting, and it was Marcy and two other women and me. And that's how I started sort of being a, 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 a teacher in the junior high, senior high class. I started leading worship. Some of you remember when they took Louie Louie and turned it into Pharaoh Pharaoh? Whoa, baby, let my people go. Uh. Yeah. It was deeply spiritual. But here's the thing that Marcy called. Marcy called me again. I was thinking about just how significant Marcy was specifically because she called me again and said, hey, we heard you have a guitar. <laughs> Not that you're this amazing worship leader. We heard you have a guitar setting the bar very low. You know, and I started leading worship in their, in their small group. And then the, over an infamous game of Monopoly on New Year's Eve, I rolled the dice and said, hey, Doug, do you want to go to Dayton and start a vineyard? Not, he had never said anything to me. I wasn't fasting and praying. I just thought it'd be fun. And 30 years later, you're all sitting here. It just, I really, I joke that I kind of Forrest Gumped my way into, you know, you just end up, Kind of doing this. How many Dr. Peppers did you drink? Yeah, and that sort of thing. Doug would call me, and he'd go, hey, we're going to take the bus out. He had this big bus, a school bus that he had painted, uh, 57 Chevy Green. He was very proud of this. Called it his, uh, urban, uh, his urban assault vehicle. And we would take groceries out. And I remember thinking he would call me, and I would go, well, that's, that's kind of your thing. You know, there was like, in my mind, there was a silo. It was a division of labor. That's your thing, and this is my thing. And, uh, but over the years, I remember we were driving through downtown Dayton one day, and I just said, Doug, I understand. It took me like 15 years to really understand why we go to the poor. It's not about giving them the food as much as they need the food. It's about extending the kingdom. It's about bringing light into darkness. It's about showing God's love to people who are desperate in need. And I could, you know, I could go on from there. But I just want you to know, yeah. Now, how this, I mean, I've spent a lot of time meeting, just meeting with people. And, you know, we have a pastor on call system. Somebody calls, and we have just to make sure that people get called back in a timely manner. And one time I got a call from somebody, and it was passed on to me. And it was this guy, his, his name was Rick DeRosiak. I remember it vividly for a very, very good reason I'm going to tell you about. Um, he ne just needed somebody, the, the, you know, the office person said, hey, just need somebody to talk to, wanted to talk to a pastor. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I'll go. And so I go and I have coffee with this guy, and he hands me a stack 
of, uh, of poems that he had written. They were typed, and they were binder clipped together. You know, just a stack, like maybe 25 or 30. And he presented them to me like an offering, right? And I'm going, oh, thanks, you know? And, uh, and I, I remember flipping through them, and it was called When, when God Answered, and it was Poems of Faith and Possibility or Promise, something like that. And, and months later, I remember bringing them back to the office and I put them in somebody else's mailbox. I thought, oh, Kevin would really like these because he's the recover guy, recovery guy and I put them in Kevin's box. And months later, I get an email from this guy and he said, hey, remember that stack of poems that I gave you? And I went, yeah. He goes, I got them published. And I went, oh yeah, really? He goes, yeah, you might want to pick up a copy. But to which I thought, well, why didn't you send me a copy? You know. So he, I, I go online, that's when Amazon only sold books, right? And so I, I ordered this book and it came in the mail and I open it up and in the, the little forward, right? The little dedication part, he said, thank you to my pastor so-and-so who, who introduced me to Jesus. Thank you for Chris, Tom, Tom, uh, let's see, yeah, Chris Tomlin and Michael W. Smith for your music that's been so inspiring. Then he threw Joel Osteen in there. Thank you to Joel Osteen for your encouraging messages. And thank you to Scott Sliver, pastor at Vineyard Church in Beaver Creek, for taking the time to meet with me. Never underestimate the power of having just a coffee with someone. Just, and I thought, what if I had blown him off? You know, what if... What if I just sort of went, eh, whatever. But when you're spending time with people, if you give them your attention, you give them your focus, you listen and just be an encouraging person. You know, we tend to think of prophecy as like speaking these deep things, but prophecy, the spirit of prophecy is encouragement. The New Testament model is he who prophesies speaks to strengthening, encouragement, and comfort over somebody or to someone. I thought, wow, I never thought I'd be in a list with Joel Osteen. <laughs> Interesting. In Romans 12, 1, it says this, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. And then catch this, this is your true and proper worship. What is your true and proper worship? That we offer our, living, our bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. That passage in Romans 12 goes on to say this. Catch this. In Christ, we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, prophesy. In accordance with the faith, with your faith, if it's serving, then serve. See, we're all called to serve, but some people have a gift of serving. You can be encouraging. You can speak strength and comfort over somebody and not have this you know, deep gift of prophecy. Some people have it, and it's just, it bubbles out of them. You know them. We, they, they're up here every Sunday in front praying for people. If you need encouragement, come up front and be encouraged today. So we're all called to serve, but I don't need to have the gift of serve of serving to do that we're all called to share our faith that doesn't mean i'm an evangelist i am not an evangelist that gift doesn't appear in my top six it doesn't but i share my faith out of love for people if your gift is teaching then teach if it's encouraging then give encouragement if it's giving then give generously we're all called to give i believe in tithing and giving offerings but there are some people that they just are generous and God's blessed them and they, they just give abundantly because it's their gift. We're all called to give, but we don't have to have the gift of giving to give. If your gift is leadership, be diligent. If it's showing mercy, mercy, do it cheerfully. You know, one of my, one of my favorite stories in the Bible is about Joseph in the Old Testament, Old Testament Joseph. A kid who has a dream, he's got a bunch of older brothers. He says, hey guys, let me tell you about this dream. There's a sun and the moon, and I was the, and your stars bowed down to me, and uh, isn't that great? And they went, yeah, we hate you. 
And uh, it's, in, it's in Genesis like 37 through 41, this story. I'm just going to encapsulate it. And, and so he goes out. His father sends the younger brother out to check on the older brothers, which I'm sure they loved, the annoying little brother. You're like, get out of here, kid. Get out of here, kid. You bother me. And he went to check on them, and they go, you know what? Here comes that dreamer, you know, and they said, let's kill him. <laughs> I mean, what older brother hasn't wanted to kill a younger brother, right? But they actually, one of them says, no, nah, we really can't do that. And uh, so they, they sell him into slavery. They take the coat that his father had made for him, you know, the Technicolor coat that's been made into a Broadway show and a movie and all that. And they take it, they put some blood on it, and they say, oh, sorry, your son that you loved is dead. And so he gets sold into slavery, he becomes a, a servant in Potiphar's house. He's running the house. It says Potiphar takes no thought for anything while, while Joseph was in charge. The problem is Potiphar's wife hits on Joseph all the time. It says she was relentless in pursuing him. And he finally leaves. She accuse him, uh, accuses him of assault, uh, assault falsely. He gets thrown in prison. He ends up running the prison as a prisoner. It's almost like getting a weird promotion, going from running Potiphar's house to th being thrown in prison. And then he runs the prison. It's the same thing. It says the prison the guards gave, took no thought, and he, he's in charge of everything. He interprets dreams. Ultimately, he interprets, interprets a dream for Pharaoh and becomes vice Pharaoh. So the annoying dreamer little brother, right? You, you track this, right? False to, uh, accused falsely, ends up in prison, interprets the dream. That's the very short version of this. The point is to go from being a prisoner to vice Pharaoh, and, and Pharaoh says, is there anyone, you know, anybody else who has the wisdom of Joseph? And then he says this, he says, only I, speaking of himself, Pharaoh, only I will be greater than you in all of Egypt. Wow. Any of you see Aladdin? Like, if that were me, I'd have the elephant make way for Prince Scotty, you know, that's what it would be right there. But he put him in charge of everything, and, and because of his wisdom, he ended up saving all of Egypt, saving his family, his brothers ended up, yes, they bowed down to him, which is a great story. It's great how he messed with them. You got to read it, okay? That's, that's like a series for another day. I'm going to wrap this up. I'm going to land this plane, because I always ask, well, what do I do now? How does this apply to my life? I'm going to just do a little bit of a lightning round. Okay, ready? First Peter 4, Peter said this, each one of you, who doesn't that apply to? All of us, right? Each of you should use whatever gift, say whatever gift, whatever gift, whatever your gift is, you have received to serve others. Okay, it's pretty broad and pretty pretty focused. I'll take your gift and do whatever and serve other people. Ephesians 2, for we are God's handiwork or we're his masterpiece created in Christ Jesus for what? To do good works. There it is again, which, and I love this part, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Like I'll, I'll be doing something. I wonder if God prepared this like before the foundations of the world that I'd be doing this. Don't, don't think too much on that. You won't sleep tonight if you start... Colossians 3, Paul also wrote this. Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, what doesn't that cover? <laughs> everything I say, everything I do, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Here's my encouragement to you today. Do something. Just don't do nothing. Don't just drift, drift along. And how you express the gifts, it's not just about taking a lasagna to our neighbors because they might be hungry. It's about building relationship with them so that when they're in the hospital, that you're the person that they call or something's happening. And, I, you know, it gets a little tricky. I have a neighbor. I buy her a bus pass every month, and then I get the series of, hey, can you give me $10 for this or $4 for that, you know, and it can be a little bit overwhelming, and I have to establish boundaries. Hey, look, I'm not an ATM. I know you think I'm an ATM, but I'm not. Happy to do this. Let me show you something that I did a while back. Bring up this picture. 
I just put up the structure for a tent, put up some Edison lights, put the fire pit there, did some hot dogs, had a cooler of drinks, and you should have seen their faces when I pulled out the skewers of shrimp with Old Bay seasoning on them. And they're, oh. And it's just to build relationship. It's just to show people love. It's not to get anything. There's a whole lot in the Bible, in the New Testament, about parties and about banquets and who you invite. He said, hey, you go out, and he's talking about the kingdom, and it's going to be like this, and you go invite, and the people who said no, he says, then go get the, pl- the poor, the blind, the lame, and the naked. And I go, oh, it sounds like a great party, right? All those naked blind people running around. That's, that's funny. Sorry, I couldn't resist. Anybody can do this. Whatever it is that you're going to do, whether in word or deed, just don't treat people like projects. Don't do it. We're intentional. We're intentional about what we do. Bonnie will go buy flowers and matching flowers, whatever the pot is on ours. We give one to Michelle. We give one to Gary, Phyllis, who used to live across the street from us, right? And so we look like a cohesive neighborhood, like when you're driving through Oakwood, Right? And just it's. Not trying to fix anything. People ask us all the time why we live where we live. I just got so tired of people talking about how divided Dayton was. We decided we were going to live on the other side of town. That's, it was really that simple. Just to love people, to experience what it's like being the minority. And I have. And it's always interesting. It is. Don't pe- treat people like projects. How about this verse out of 1 John chapter 2? He who says he abides in him, or another translation said, whoever claims to live in Christ ought himself to walk just as Jesus walked. That's, that's our model. Jesus came to show us the Father, and then we show people what Jesus really looks like. We walk by faith, not by sight. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Just, to me, it's just, it really is just that. Just doing the best I can. Not perfectly. I'm still in process. But just taking it a step at a time. Honey, is this the Lord? Should we be doing it? She'll come home and say, hey, I did this today. I gave this person this, or I did this thing. I gave this person a ride. And we, we try and do things like that. We don't say yes all the time. You don't ha- say, have to say yes all the time. But you shouldn't say no all the time. I know that. I don't know where the line is. It's probably different for you than it is for us, and that's okay. But if you live by the Spirit, keep in step with the Spirit. And again, in 1 John, he said, let us not love with just words or speech, but with actions and with truth. You know, and I think about how I ended up where I am. It really feels more like in Acts chapter 4, Peter and John healed the person. They said, Sil- silver and gold we don't have. Sorry, I'm tapped out, but what we have we give to you. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And then they got arrested for it. And said so they wanted to beat them. <laughs> they, ultimately, they did. But they said, but when they saw, the, uh, they saw the courage of Peter and John, they took note that they were ordinary, unschooled men, but they had been with Jesus. I think that's what people should be able to say about all of us. Amen? Would you stand? In the, in the Old Testament book of Isaiah, there's a beautiful passage in Isaiah 6. And it says, he was in the, in the presence of the Lord, and you know, his train filled the temple, and there's all this spiritual stuff happening. And, and he says, I'm, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Any of you say that? <laughs> he says, but I'll go. God says, who am I going to send? Who will go for us? Hmm. And he says, I'll go. And it says, an angel came and took a coal off the altar and touched it to his lips, immediately thereby taking care of that. I'm a man of unclean speech, right? 
And he touched it and he says, there, your guilt is gone and your sin is forgiven. And he said, I'll go. And then God told him what he was gonna do. My challenge today is for each of us to say in your heart, I'll go. Lord, I'll go. And it's easy to default to, okay, suddenly now he's gonna send me to China or Africa. Or, you know, that's a very small percentage of people, really. Most of us are just gonna be stuck here in Dayton, you know, living our lives. Maybe you go on a mission trip like I did. You never know. If you would just close your eyes for a moment and if you're willing to say right now, Lord, I'll go. I just want you to put your hand on your heart. If that's the cry of your heart, just to say, Lord, I'll go. What you just did is half the battle. I'm, I'm convinced of it. Lord, for each person, they just put their hand on their heart to say, I'll go. I pray, Lord, that you would give them encouraging words for people. I pray that the Lord would even increase your finances, that, that like money would show up, that you could bless other people with that, that he would give you eyes to see and ears to hear what people are saying and doing around you that you would be able to see and just walk up to somebody and go, hey, are you okay? Do you need something? I pray that the Lord would empower each of you by his Holy Spirit right now in a fresh way. That your words would have weight that you would see the fruit of just having coffee with someone. That you would see the fruit of kindness, that you would see the fruit of just loving the people around you. And that when the person in the cubicle next to you or the neighbors that live next to you or the people you know that, they, that don't even live around you, but they call you when they have the meltdown and they don't know what they're going to do. And you say, well, let me just pray for you. And you just muster up a prayer. This, this is a really powerful moment. It really makes me think about when Jesus called the disciples. He went to Peter and said, hey, try throwing your nets out on the other side of the boat. And Peter's like, man, we've been fishing all night. <laughs> and Jesus said, just let your nets down. And they got a catch so big, they just couldn't even believe it. And Peter fell before Jesus and said, Lord, go away from me. I'm a sinful man. Sinful man. I bless each one of you. Now, you may be here today, and if, if, if this is all news to you, like you've never heard this before, you know, you, maybe you weren't like me growing up in church, whatever, but I just, if, you, if you've never said yes to Jesus, just put your hand on your heart and say, yeah, Lord, I'm saying yes to you. I don't even know what that means, but I believe in you. I want to know you. In Revelation, it says, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, he says, I, I will come in, and have, he'll have fellowship with you. Thank you, Lord. Wow. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.